But a lot of that is then still attached to other things like the festivals and the moons and following Rosh Hashanah or the Hebrew calendar or any of those other festivals which are all fulfilled in Christ. Every type and shadow is fulfilled in Christ. Why go back to types and shadows when we have the absolute fulfillment and truth in Christ? It's a retrograde step taking people back into the old. And I think it's a deception. And I think people need to be really, really careful in embracing it. So um, there's a lot of what I'm I'm calling mix, mixture going on right now, um, especially working with people from across board. And there's a lot of understanding of Christ yet a lot of rejection and resistance to Jesus going mm. on. I don't know if I'm the only one who is getting this vibe. There is, a, there is an understanding that God is not a tribal God, which is amazing. But then there is a conflict in what is believed to be Christ and who Jesus is. I don't know if you have, you have seen this. And it is making it a bit difficult to explain yeah um, yeah yeah i i've sort of i i a few people have actually mentioned that um i mean i don't really connect up with much that's out there to be honest so i don't, I don't really pick up an awful lot of various things that are happening but if you think of jesus the new testament obviously uses the word um jesus a lot and it also uses the word christ a lot and sometimes it uses the word jesus christ a lot and sometimes it uses christ jesus the lord um, and it usually puts it together with lordship as well so what do all those things mean and i think part of the problem is people read things literally and then trying to trying to make something out of something that's not there so they read the word christ and then because it didn't say Jesus, then they think that must be different from Jesus. And so they're reading a lot into the obviously what the Bible says, you know, um, and. If you do that and you don't do it from a relational place, having known who Jesus Christ, the Lord is or the Lord Jesus Christ, and you don't know him personally, then you can come up with all sorts of fanciful ideas that christ isn't the son of god or christ is a almost sort of force or principle or whatever and a in question. reality obviously the old testament uses the messiah and then christ is the new testament word for messiah anointed one and his anointing and they separate the anointing from the anointed one and talk about the christ anointing as if that is separate from jesus well the spirit of the sovereign lord was upon him he was anointed now are we anointed yes the spirit of the sovereign lord is upon us and in us as well so from that perspective you know there is a a an anointing which comes from sonship um, but that anointing is not for us to be the messiah you know it's not a messiah anointing so in a sense obviously the word christ had more meaning in the early church in the period when they were looking for the messiah the jewish people but also the christians recognized jesus as the messiah the jewish christians and therefore they were all um trying to understand this connection between the old covenant and the new covenant and that Jesus effectively was the fulfillment of the old covenant in the new covenant. So you have a lot of a lot of different terminology where Paul particularly and others are trying to help them understand the context of who Jesus was, uh, how he related to the seed of Abraham, how he related to the anointed one who was going to come. And obviously Jesus came and completely challenged their whole view of what the Messiah was about. 
because their view was, well, it's only going to do bring Israel back into world power, you know, which nothing to do with that at all. So we have a lot of um, different perspectives, views, opinions based on terminology and words, a lot of it without context and without understanding who it was talking to and why it was talking to them about it. And just reading it today and coming up with a lot of fanciful nonsense, really, which tries to differentiate and separate it all up. And it's all one. Father, Son and Spirit are one in God, if you like, but have you know different perspectives, aspects, uh, personality um, in their role as Father, Son and Spirit. But you could say God and you could mean all of them. You could say God and you could mean one of them. You could say God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, <laughs> all God, but um, don't really need a, a definition which separates them other than helps us understand when we meet them, how we relate to them. You know, so when it comes then for, well, there is no Trinity. Well, yes, the New Testament doesn't specifically say the word Trinity. But it does refer to Father, Son and Spirit. You know, it talks about baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son and Spirit. You know, Jesus really clearly said he and the Father were one. He definitely refers to the Spirit. Um, and therefore, why all the fuss? You know, I think people have just got not got enough to do. And they just come up with stuff because they just got too much time thinking about irrelevances, to be honest. It's irrelevant. If you know Jesus, you know the Father, you know the Spirit, well, you know them. So you know they're they're functioning together in a circle of relationship. They are the perichoresis, the dance, or the conversation of God. They are that. And if you meet them, you know that. A lot of people who come up with these doctrinal ideas have never met Father, Son, and Spirit. Mm. They know about them from the Bible, and they can come up with all these weird ideas that separate them or separate their function of course jesus whose name means savior has a different connotation to christ as anointed one but jesus was anointed as the savior you know so they're all tied together you can't separate out the function from the person and yes. sort of come up with which where i think it's going to the christ spirit that say well we're all christ yes we're all anointed yes but we're not all christ we're all anointed and you could say that is talking about the anointed one and his anointing and we've all been benefiting from his anointing on us and in us but we're not him uh, you know but we are you know if you think of christians little christ's little anointed ones who carry his anointing but we're not him but we are sons like him and we're called to come into a union of have the mind of christ and you could say that is an anointed mind or an anointed way of coming into agreement in oneness and wholeness perhaps so you can come up with all sorts of different ideas and different opinions and different doctrinal perspectives but I'm not listening to anything that does not come from a relationship and personal experience. And I know some of it is leading people away from the personal relational connection to Jesus, the spirit and the father into this more cosmic force, the Christ spirit, which I think is moving away from Jesus as the son of God. And I think that's where this thing is going trying to draw people off into some christ spirit rather than the spirit of christ yes who is jesus you know in that sense you know all of them work together so um i sort of don't have an you know i don't have any resonance with any of it personally and i think it's trying to complicate something which is actually quite simple and it's also i think part of an agenda which is to create a world view which you know, makes us god 
you know, which is another thing out there. Well, we're God. We're all God. You know, well, I'm not God. I may be little G, son of God. And, and Jesus did talk about us being gods in little G sense, but we're not God the Father, but we are sons of our Father. So we should be like him, but we're not him. And we should become more and more like him, but we're not him. And I think there's such a danger in making the people become the object, which means that's worshipping us. And if God, if we are God, then what's the point of having a relationship with ourselves? You know, it didn't make any sense, does it? But I know this stuff's out there and I know people get drawn off into fanciful stuff when they don't have a personal intimate relationship in a way that you know who he is and you've experienced his love and you've experienced our identity through him, which does not mean we have to dream up fanciful ideas that we are God. And there is one cosmic consciousness, which is God and we're it we're not it now am i part of a cosmic consciousness i'd like to be fully embracing the consciousness of god and to know fully his thinking and about me and everything else so i do definitely want to participate in the mind of christ and understand and know the truth of who he is but jesus is the way the truth and the life i'm not yeah. and i think that's where i draw the line because there's elements of truth in some of the things people say that doesn't mean it's true. And you have to find the truth in Jesus, who is the truth. Otherwise, we run into all sorts of things of creating our own truth out of our own ideas. And you know, we shouldn't be leaning to our own understanding when it comes to any of these things. Yeah. Okay, I I think a lot is also coming from, um, I can't remember the name of the man now who um, wrote, um, um, what's the title of the book? Hearing Conversations with God and also all these Sumerian texts that are coming out and people are using it as a justification to the Old Testament story being Sumer Sumerian stories that were put together by uh, moses and all that and this is really a strong justification for their belief that um the the whole biblical story is just some people's story that was put together for us yeah i mean i mean that that whole thing has been around a long time you know um you know trying to you know, and I agree. I mean, I'm, I don't think we need a book. We don't need stories. We need relationship. You know, I don't think we should be trying to find out who God is from the Bible either, but certainly not from Sumerian texts, which are, in a sense, who were the Sumerians? Where did they come from? You know, there's a lot of dubious uh, stuff out there, and some of it indicating that the Sumerians seem to have knowledge that came, you know, extra dimensionally, you know, and was given to them. And they appeared very with this knowledge and took on position of some sort of government. You know, so I personally feel our conversations with God should be personal. Mm. You know, we should have our own relationship in which we're talking to God and having a relationship with God. And I wouldn't want to be drawn into all sorts of weird and wacky things, which is unnecessary to have. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff been around for years and years and years, you know, you know, ancient alien stuff and all sorts of things which are indicating that we're being, you know, affected by alien. Well, there's truth to that. You know, the Watcher Angels definitely came and they definitely polluted human line and there was things around that and that has an agenda behind it. You know, I totally accept that. But in a sense, as we encounter God ourselves and we encounter Father, Son and Spirit, we won't get uh, drawn away into fanciful ideas if you know the truth mm. if you only have information and if you only have doctrines and theology 
And it's very easy for those doctrines and theologies to flip from one thing, the new thing, the latest thing to the next latest thing. You know, and these books are, in a sense, you know, the latest things. And they are undermining the truth of who Jesus and the Father and the Spirit is by coming up with all sorts of fanciful ideas, then trying to justify those fanciful ideas with ancient texts and everything else. Uh, you know, Jesus said, my sheep can hear my voice. I'm quite happy with that. I talk to the Father. I'm in communion with the Father. I fellowship with the Father, you know, and I don't really need a whole lot of, you know, stuff written by other people um, and stuff pointing to ancient history or whatever else to affirm anything yeah i know the truth his name's jesus i have no problem with that you know jesus is the only way to the father jesus may use all sorts of terminology and he may be referred to in all sorts of different ways but he's still jesus he's the only way to the father he is the door for the sheep to come mm. you know and that those sheep hear his voice and they follow him through the door you know and, and i think that's for me that's my perspective now i know there's all sorts of stuff out there if you're going to know the genuine it will help you to discern what isn't so i look at something the frequency that it carries do i resonate with it if it doesn't carry the hallmark and the frequency of god and love no i'm not going to resonate with it i'm just going to think now nah, another another someone's idea which may contain some some elements of truth but actually i'd rather just engage with the truth yeah, as we navigate um ourselves through the the message of immortality mm -hmm. and around you people are dying and loved ones are, loved ones are dying how do you reconcile or navigate this without not without i should just say how do you navigate this okay. uh, well you have to look at the as in anything there are those who have not yet come to the full knowledge of the truth so they're living out of their own understanding or out of what they've been programmed in and we've been programmed to believe we're going to die you know everyone expects to die they're programmed from birth to believe they're going to die one day so they don't really have a mindset of immortality or have an understanding of it or a belief system which comes from that point now you know in, in timothy it talks about life and immortality have come to light through the gospel through the good news you know, that's good news that it's come to light but doesn't mean everyone knows it and that's the problem just because that truth is there in the light, it doesn't mean everyone is seeing it. Just the same as not everyone is seeing who they really are as a son of God. We are sons of God, but people don't necessarily know the reality of being a son of God. So it's more a renewal of the mind to actually come into alignment with what is already true. And if you don't live in the knowledge of that truth by experience, then, of course, you're going to die because you won't have any expectation of anything other than that but if we sort of take what jesus said and we take what paul said when he wrote to timothy and we see yeah life and immortality has come to light through the gospel then there's a sense that what does that mean in context of everyday life and just because people are dying doesn't negate the truth that there's immortality being brought to light it just means that people are not in the, the revelation of that truth. Now, the same would be for salvation. Jesus died for the sins of the world. He's reconciled the world to himself. But it doesn't mean everyone actually is into entering into the fullness and living in the benefit of that yet. Because they don't know it by their own experience. It's true. It is the truth. But they've not yet entered into the truth. And I think we have to enter into the truth of immortality. And it's really important not to look at what's going on in the world and measure the truth against what people are experiencing in the world. Because otherwise you'll be swayed by everything that's going on in the world, which isn't an alignment to what God's best is or what God desires. 
creation is longing waiting for the sons of god to be revealed creation is longing for us to enter into the reality of who we really are and, and the glory of that so we can bring freedom to the bondage that creation is in jesus has done everything but it still needs to be outworked um, you know so when you read uh, 2 timothy 1 9 and 10 it says who saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works number one is grace so we've not, not done anything we can't work for this we can earn it but according to his own purpose and grace so we are called according to his own purpose who saved us you know that is the key he's done the work which was granted us in christ jesus for all eternity so it's been granted to us everything that jesus done to save us and call us with this holy calling is according to his purpose and grace and it has been granted was granted already to us in christ for all eternity but has now so in other words this was the desire of god from the beginning from the lamb slain before the foundation of the world or from jesus who gave himself as a guarantee that all creation would be restored even before creation started by identifying with us in sonship so it goes on to say and if you look at it and has now been revealed by the appearing of our savior christ jesus what did he do abolished death who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel so we have a statement there that says this is all through what jesus has done that he has abolished death well when something is abolished what does it mean no longer in effect okay so death the power of death has been abolished now does that mean people don't die well it's the same for the same we abolished the law that you have to cross you have to i don't know wear a seatbelt now you abolish the law but people can carry on wearing a seatbelt if they like and i would even if they abolish the law in the uk that you didn't have to wear a seatbelt by law i would continue to wear it because for me it's the safest thing to do so jesus has abolished the power of death over us but that doesn't mean that we won't be subject to it if we choose to or if we don't know that it's been abolished so for most people they don't know it's been abolished like if government passed a law and said you no longer need to wear a seatbelt but they didn't tell anybody the law would be on the statutes but no one would know it existed and it's that most people don't know what jesus did in abolishing death and bringing you abolish it and brought life now that was the abundant life that he was talking about and immortality to light through the gospel so that good news that message of what jesus has done has made available the truth of immortality of abundant life but that doesn't mean everyone knows it or believes it or experiences it yet but it doesn't negate the truth jesus died for the sins of the world people are still not believing in that and living in lost identity doesn't mean that what jesus did wasn't effective or powerful it was but people have not yet realized it so they're not living in the truth of it so i think that's the reality now in john 6 jesus talked um, about life um abundant life and he also talked about um, not dying so you have a whole thing about jesus being the bread of life okay so jesus described himself and he was talking about whoever would eat my flesh and drink my blood would live forever um, and not die so it's important to get what was he talking about and he was talking about himself being the source of life and john 10 10 the enemy comes to kill rob kill and destroy but i've come to give you life in abundance abundant life in contrast to rob kill and destroy which is what the enemy wants to do 
So you look at what Jesus said. Well, are people still being robbed, killed and destroyed? Yes. Are people living in the fullness of abundant life? No, but it's not. The, the problem is not Jesus's side. It's on our side. So when you then look at what Jesus said in John 6, yeah, truly, truly, I say to you. The one who believes has eternal life. Now, eternal, the word anios does not mean. Forever and ever and ever in that context. Is talking more about the quality of life that comes from the eternal realm than the length of life. So eternal life is not the length of life, but the quality of life. That means we have the fullness of life from the eternal realm. I am the bread of life. So that's here's the statement that everything about immortality is based on. I am the bread of life. So he was now saying. To them, if they were to partake of the bread of life, they would be able to have that eternal quality of life. And then he goes on to say, and they didn't need to die. OK, so then he says, you know, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. So what came out of supernatural provision for bread manna which appeared every morning or six days a week on a morning and they ate it and they were sustained but they still died physically they still died all of those aged up until you know over the age of 19 when they went into the died before they crossed into the promised land all those died there was a new generation that went in so you have the whole perspective. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. Now this then he says, this is the bread that comes down out of heaven so that anyone may eat from it and not die. Now, you can't take the context of those who died in the wilderness because when they ate earth manna. And then say that Jesus is not talking about physical death because he's actually equating the difference between eating manna and physically dying, which was what happened in the old covenant and eating of Jesus, his body and not dying, which is what the new covenant is all about. So anyone. So this is not this now those Israelites who were given manna from heaven. This is anyone can eat. So anyone can partake of who Jesus is as the son of God and not die. I am the living bread that came out of heaven. If anyone eats from this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I will give him for the life of the world also is my flesh. So he was equating what he was going to do in dying to overcome death. With then partaking of what he's done not really talking about being a cannibal and eating literal flesh he's talking about partaking in the life which came because of what he did in overcoming death in the resurrection so we now have resurrection life so i am the living bread that came down out of heaven if anyone eats from this bread he will live forever now the word forever doesn't mean forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever in context it actually means to the end of the age age enduring well the new covenant age goes on and endures and will not end there is no end to the increase in his government and peace so you could say that this age the new covenant age won't end therefore we won't have to die now, there's obviously death has different components, physical death and spiritual death. Now, it also says that we all died in Adam in Corinthians 15. We all died in Adam, but we're all made alive in Christ. Same all. So all of us were separated from God spiritually, which is what spiritual death really is referring to. 
and we're all now made alive in Christ and been brought back into spiritual life. So there is, again, you know, it is appointed man once to die. Well, we died with Christ in Romans 6. We died with him. We were buried with him. We were resurrected with him. We were raised with him. So we all died with Christ. Who took us into his death so that we would be free from Adam's death and now be brought into resurrection life. So we're all now made alive in Christ. Now, you could say that is spiritual life, which leads to immortal life. So you have this whole thing, which is sort of confusing, I understand, about what is spiritual life, spiritual death, physical life, spiritual life, physical death, all these things. But what is clear is we all died with Christ. What is clear is we were all dead in Adam. And what is clear is we're all made alive in Christ. So the same all. Whatever happened, all of us have now entered into what Christ has done in a completely different way now you know but we have to engage in i am the bread of life and i am the living bread and we have to enter into what he did so we can live and not die and there are people who can anyone can partake of that and not die but you have to enter into it and i would suggest that this has been spiritualized by most christian denominations and theology and not saying as the literal thing which equates to don't die you know which is physical but you cannot not die physically unless you've been made alive spiritually because life and immortality has been brought to light through the good news so you have to enter into the revelation of the truth or the light of the reality that immortality belongs to us when we partake of the life of God, when we are entering into his living bread and when we are partaking, eating of it, symbolically saying that we are partaking in the life that he has made available through the resurrection by dying with him and being raised with him. That is what happened. Now, obviously, it goes on to say obviously, this is a big problem to the Jewish people because they weren't allowed to eat anyone's flesh. They weren't allowed to eat blood. So he then goes on to say, you know, Jesus said, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourself. So now he's now saying you will have no life, which is the eternal type of life in yourself you will still be dead in Adam until you're made alive in him and you partake of that. So I believe the whole of the world, the whole of everyone has been made alive in Christ, but they have not partaken of it. They've not entered into it because they've not know that, that it's true. Um, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. Now, it doesn't say live forever it says eternal life which is the life which is the essence and nature that comes from the eternal realm which is the quality and really isn't to do with anything to do with the length it's the quality of life i will raise him up on the last day well the last day was the last day of an old covenant and the first day of the new covenant in fullness the end of the age the last day the day of resurrection and judgment nothing to do with the end of the world this isn't talking about the last day of the world because there is not going to be a last day of the world it is talking about the last day of the end of the old so when the old fully ends the new will fully begin so i'm going to raise him up on the last day so he will enter into the resurrection life on that last day now, that last day has already happened, happened you know, nearly 2000 years ago. Um, and as Jesus said, it would on that day. So my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in life. And I in him, 
So here is the relationship where he's in us and we're in him, which is what he said. We are now in I am where he is in the father. We are. So we've now entered a whole different relationship with the father through Jesus, the son um, in that way. And as the living father sent me and I live because of the father, the one who eats me will also live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. You know, it's Jesus now quoting it again. This is the bread that came out down from heaven, not as the fathers did and died, ate and died. But this who eats this bread will live forever. So we'll continue in this new covenant age. Now, you could say that even those who've died haven't died. Physically, their bodies have died, yet their soul and spirit lives on. So they've not actually died. But they physically died. But Jesus was basically saying, you don't need to physically die. As your fathers did in the wilderness. You don't need to die physically. But if you essentially, if anyone does die physically, it's only their body which has died. Their soul and spirit is still alive which is why it carries on after physical death. And if you know Jesus, then it carries on in relationship with itself in one soul spirit person. If you don't know Jesus, then the spirit returns to the father and the soul goes into the fire of the father's presence to be refined and purified so that they can then reconnect in the father. And I've seen it happen when a person has come out of the fire of god's loving presence accepting jesus as savior has returned to the father been embraced by the father and the spirit and soul and then reintegrated into one being if you've already embraced the relationship with through jesus and the father you already have spirit and soul becoming one being although there's a bit of struggling for the soul to get to the point of surrender so that spirit and soul can be totally reintegrated and made whole in one but it but it does happen you know so when we look around and look at the world you see all sorts of things which are not god's intention and uh, all sorts of things happening which were not god's desire that they're happening but they are happening does that mean that god's desire is not okay no you know just because some people are dying doesn't mean that everyone has to die but you do have to enter into the fullness of the life that comes from partaking of that bread and of the power of his blood, which is a symbol of life giving um, salvation. You know? And we obviously see this as a symbol of communion. You know, this is how it's been taken. But I think it goes way beyond communion. Because here, in one sense, it, it, it's, it doesn't talk about communion as in Jesus later in, instigates this as this is the new covenant in my blood. This is my bread body is broken for you. He hadn't yet explained that he was going to go to the cross and die in that way to them. So this is quite a challenge. And of course, so many of them were so challenged by this very unpleasant statement that they left him. It was offensive. Jesus said, I was aware his disciples were complaining about this and said, is this offensive to you? What then if you see the son of man ascending to where he was before, if the spirit who gives life, the, it is the spirit who gives life, the flesh prophets no better. <coughs> so I've spoken to you, our spirit in life. Therefore, some of you do not believe what Jesus knew from the beginning. For they who do not believe and those who would betray him. So he was he was seeing some people, Judas in this instance, wouldn't believe in what he was saying. But all of them struggled with it because it was so alien to their whole religious culture and upbringing. Completely alien that they would eat blood, drink blood and eat flesh. You know, but Jesus was not talking physically, obviously. He was talking about the symbolic nature that would be of entering into everything that he has done on the cross okay Amoy you got your hand up there yeah hello Mike can you hear me hi yeah hello everyone um I was just gonna I once heard you talking about how you um 
to wrap your spirit about things, how you can release your spirit to wrap it about either yourself or, and, or something else outside from you. How do you, how do you do this? Like, you didn't explain in the video how you do that. Okay. Um, well, there is a difference between the consciousness of our spirit and the sort of the deposit of our spirit within, which has expandable boundaries, if you like, um, flexible. And so you can extend your spirit out around the spheres that you have authority in or over, and you can therefore create an atmosphere within there, which is the flow of life, which flow from your innermost being, which was of the river of life or the spirit, which can flow and you can create that atmosphere. So you can engage your spirit um, in a way of surrounding someone so that person can experience what you have um, in your relationship with God, in a sense. Um, that intimacy, that first love, uh, which is what we do within our spirit, within us, within the boundaries of our spirit. But our conscious spiritual consciousness can be engaged anywhere. Um, my spiritual consciousness is in the realms of heaven, doesn't operate within my physical body, but I am connected from spirit to soul, spirit to the core of my innermost being, where I am one spirit, soul and body within the Merkaba within me. That is a both a transport system of portals and a communication array, if you like, so I can be continually connected no matter where I am, quantumly entangled anywhere in the known universe or anywhere within dimensions or in the realms of heaven or in eternity or wherever, I'm still connected to me. So it's like um, a container that your spiritual consciousness can be housed in and the Holy Spirit can be in within us, the area of first love, if you say, think that way, that has the ability to extend its boundaries, its borders um, around that which we have a measure of authority towards and that means a person you can engage a person but i can also engage my spirit with a person's spirit so i can speak to their spirit i can call forth their spirit to rise up arthur burke has a whole book on speaking to the spirit you can speak to your own spirit um, but you can engage your spirit with someone else's spirit to create an environment of safety, security, connection, if you like, which I think is what we're supposed to do in marriage, where we're to be one spirit, soul and body. Therefore, our spirits need to be connected. Now, what I've chosen to do is open my spirit to others. So when I'm doing a conference or something like that, I'll open my spirit so that people can draw on my spirit, not just my soul, because they can draw on my soul and they get answers that i know answers to certain things but they can draw on my spirit and they can receive things that i might not have ever said before or communicated before but my spirit has that knowledge so that sort of means that i open my spirit so that people can engage me and i can open my spirit like my first love gate so that someone else can also feel and sense my relationship and my spirit with god because within me, Father, Son and Spirit dwell within that first love area within my spirit. So they dwell within me. So before the Holy Spirit was in my life or would have, it's always been he's always been in my life. But let's say in the old covenant, the Holy Spirit wasn't in people. So if someone's spirit left their body. They could die. Because you need spirit, which is the essence of life and soul and body to be alive. Um, so you needed the connection with the Holy Spirit there in some way so they wouldn't die. In the new covenant, everyone's been made alive in the spirit. Therefore, the spirit is in everyone. So my spirit can be outside of my physical body, but connected to it in that way. So how do I do it? By intention. I choose to do it by intention with a desire to facilitate whatever it is that God is, I guess, empowering me or sharing with me that I have permission to do. Um, now, generally, that now is a state of being. Um, but sometimes I focus on that state of being and just think about 
surrounding and engaging and particularly opening up my uh, self so people have access to me um, in a way and I open myself up in every one of these sessions so that you can draw from my spirit not just for my soul the title for the art of work book you mentioned about um, that he talked of, talk about talking to your spirit was the title for the book um I, what the title for my other book going beyond beyond no no arthur burke the one you mentioned about oh, arthur arthur burke. Burke. oh sorry arthur burke's book yeah i think it's it's a it's a book about speaking to the spirit i think i think that's what the book is called i've, I've got a feeling um okay. but but it's you know I, mean, I think i've got the book somewhere um but um I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not endorsing it or the methodology he might use. I'm just saying other people do engage the spirit or th sort of talk about speaking to someone's spirit. Because sometimes the soul is absolutely fragmented in a person. How are you going to engage that person unless you address their spirit? Because if you address their soul, you might speak to a fragmented, broken part of the soul or a dissociated part of the soul. And sometimes people speak to people and it feels like they're speaking to multiple personalities. So if that's the case, speaking to someone's spirit direct is a powerful way to get the spirit to rise up and to begin to outwork that identity and bring about integration in, in their own lives. So there are different things that you can do in addressing and engaging with um, someone's spirit. But I would obviously need to make sure I have the permission to do it i wouldn't do it to anyone just because i could because i want to make sure that i have the right uh sense of this is what the father's doing so i can only do what i see the father doing and when you know when i would ever look to do anything like that i would make sure that i felt that i knew this was the father's heart um yeah but in ministry if you're ministering to someone sometimes you need to address their spirit because they were not hearing you in the soul so there are different ways of, of doing it when i actually do it it's really it's been a sense of choice and intention and i can surround my spirit around all the spheres that i have authority in you know it's like you know when you think of uh, the temple in ezekiel it talks about rivers of water flowing under the threshold of the temple from the east gate and flowing outwards ankle yeah. deep knee deep waist deep well you can think of it as your spirit is going out and going wider and wider to create a area where the spirit can engage and connect both my spirit and the holy spirit because um, i'm creating an atmosphere or an environment where the holy spirit can touch those areas that i have surrounded but it's really much out of desire uh, to bless really okay i'm gonna want to bless someone and therefore i'm gonna want them to know that i am have the authority to bless them and if they're within my sphere like my family or whatever in past church sphere or whatever then there was a measure where i had authority to bless them you know, but I couldn't control them or make them do what I wanted to do. That's not that's not what it's about. It's about creating a safe environment for them to be nurtured in the spirit and to receive from me that which would be something that would nurture them or feed them in some positive way. You know, and that's really the desire. I'm not looking to surround someone and then make them do what I want them to do. You know, it's about blessing them, creating a safe environment for them. And sometimes people need to feel secure and by surrounding them, you can give them. No, I don't just surround people. I've surrounded angelic beings and other things for other purposes. You know, there's definitely a, a role there of engaging our spirit with somebody. Um, okay. I also want to ask about the um, second intention, how to do that accurately. Because uh, here, look, they make an intention. I also said it too, that. How do you set an intention? So would you just describe steps to do that? Well, an intention really is a is a focused desire. 
this is what I intend to do. And I'm going to focus my desire for the fulfillment of that intention. But to do that, I need to know what the father's intentions are. So I need to engage the father's heart, know what his intentions and purposes are. And then I'll know whether I can align myself in agreement with his intentions and purposes and outwork those intentions and purposes within my life and within my spheres of authority. I may know the father's intention and it may not be my his intention that I do it. So I've got to be careful that I don't assume that because I know the father's intention is to bless somebody, that I have the authority to go and bless them immediately because it might be someone else's role to do that. I've got to be careful that I don't do something just because I can. So I engage the father's heart, find the father's desires, engage them. That begins to change my desires, to align with his desires. I then carry his voice. I am a voice, if you like, that I can speak that intention into being by choosing the reality that will form that intention. But if people are involved, people have the power to resist that intention if they so choose. So again, this is not about controlling someone to do what you want them to do. Even if what you want them to do is what the father wants them to do. They have to make that choice themselves. But I can look to do whatever I have the ability to do to create the place where that intention can take place. And it's usually a place of relationship where someone is able to receive from someone else because they are in a place of trust. And I trust them. So, you know, God's intentions. Let's say God has an intention for creation, for creation to be set free. Well, I know that creation will be set free into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And I know that creation is longing and waiting for the revealing of the children of God, or the sons of God. So I know that I already have a part to play in that. So generally, I have a part to play in God's intention for the restoration of all things. But every individual specific situation, I'm going to make sure that I have a very clear understanding that this is my role in this particular situation. Otherwise, I can just go out there and try and do everything. And that's not what the father wants. I'm so. having a... We, we've, we've had this bef we we've asked we have talked about this before but i still am encountering it and i think the movement is growing the hebrew letters yeah hmm. uh, well, it's a big subject i personally i uh, have i am very concerned about the whole hebrew roots movement and its purpose and intention and underlying, I think a lot of people are potentially being deceived into thinking they need to understand Hebrew and have a Hebrew philosophy. In reality, I don't believe that's true. We live in the new covenant where there's one new man in Christ. There is no Jew nor Gentile anymore. So I wouldn't have anything to do with anything that's trying to get us back under anything in the old covenant, whether it be festivals, moons, language, letters. No, I'm not saying that understanding Hebrew might be useful if you wanted to and try and interpret the Bible, but you're still going to interpret it through your understanding, even if you understand Hebrew. So why, when we have Jesus, who is the truth and the living word of God, Jesus is the living word of God who speaks to me. Now, do I believe in creatures that represent living letters? Yes. And do I believe that some of that might be to do with a creational aspect of how things formed? Maybe. But personally, I don't meet with the living letters. I meet with Jesus, who is the word. Because I don't want to go through another mediator. It's no different than going through the Bible as a mediator to engage God. They, now we're going through living letters as a mediator to engage God. Not anything I have no desire. God has never led me in that direction. Therefore, I don't have anything to do with it. I do also have concerns about the, in general, the Hebrew roots movement which I think is a deception trying to get people back under the law and not grace, which I would have really obviously extreme concerns about. And I do believe there is an agenda, a Luciferian agenda attached to that, which is, I'm not saying that those who do it know that. 
or they're deliberately doing anything. And there are those who are genuine people who think they're helping people by helping them understand Hebrew. But a lot of that is then still attached to other things like the festivals and the moons and following Rosh Hashanah or the Hebrew calendar or any of those other festivals, which are all fulfilled in Christ. Every type and shadow is fulfilled in Christ. Why go back to types and shadows? When we have the absolute fulfillment and truth in Christ, it's a retrograde step taking people back into the old. And I think it's a deception. And I think people need to be really, really careful in embracing it. Because there are a lot of people who do promote it. And there are a lot of people who are my friends who promote it. And I don't want to diss my friends or whatever, but I do not agree with it. And I do not have anything to do with it. And the father has warned me and that's why I've written, wrote the last book, which was all about, a lot of it was about the deception that that was to bring us back into an old covenant and to keep us from the truth of the fulfillment of everything in Jesus. All the promises of God are yes in Jesus. That means all the covenant promises. They're not some promises that would be fulfilled in Israel. Jesus is the son of God. They're fulfilled in him. All of the promises to Abraham are fulfilled in him. Some of the promises were conditional promises, which were given to Moses. Jesus came to enable those who failed in to receive those conditional promises because they failed to keep the law because it's impossible to keep the law. It's a schoolmaster to point people to the fact that it's impossible to do this in your own strength. So come to Jesus and receive the grace to do it in him. So Jesus has come to fulfill all the covenants, all the promises. And now we don't need the types and shadows which pointed to the promises being fulfilled in him. We have the fulfillment. So let's enjoy the new covenant and not get sucked back into old covenant theology understanding, which is often associated with Hebrew philosophy, roots and everything else. And do not I would not encourage anyone to get involved with the, the, the Talmud or the Kabbalah or any other of those mystic Jewish things. Be very, very careful and only engaging any of that if God actually acts, shows you to, which he might do for some reason. But why would we need to go into a mystic Jewish book when we have Jesus, the truth, to reveal the truth to us? Because you're going to get confused. And that's the problem. People are getting confused and they're getting mixed stuff within it all and there i believe there is a hidden agenda behind it which most people don't know but that is to get people back under an old system and therefore not be living in grace so. wow right i think i think you've just said it there we are so used to a medium to go to, to jesus you know we have the bible mm. and we need a point of connection for us to authenticate what we are doing. So for us to just abandon everything and say, okay, we're just going to go before God, go before Jesus without any of these things with us. We are, I think that's where we are finding it difficult. So we yeah, need course. another, we are, yeah. we are still engaging into the mediator thing or yeah. something else which is not christ which is not jesus i think when you were saying that that's what i i just got that yeah no i think that's absolutely true a mediatorial system means you have to go through someone a priest a vicar a book a ritual to get to god well no yeah. jesus is a door it's open we have direct access to god through jesus so He's the only mediator between God and man. So let's make sure we don't get caught in any other mediatorial system, which is what religion tends to do and what people feel comfortable with. That's because right, yeah. It's easier to have a set of rules to follow yeah. instead of formulas and criteria to fulfill. When it's come to relationship, you need to know the heart of the father for that direction and guidance and wisdom which is relational so much easier to have a set of rules to follow but we know that people can't follow rules 
which is why we need to follow Jesus, not rules, not laws. It's very simple. Just be engage in love. That's the new covenant. Is it covenant of love? Which is not based on rules and regulations and punishments and rewards. It's based on unconditional love, limitless grace and triumphant mercy. That's what it's based in. And that's all we need to do is to pursue the relationship. Don't get sucked back into other stuff. You don't need to learn Hebrew or Greek to relate to God because he's not Hebrew or Greek. He's God. Jesus is the word, the living word and truth. We don't need another language. He speaks to me in English. He doesn't speak to me in Hebrew or Greek. So I don't need to learn Hebrew or Greek. And if I want to know what a Greek or Hebrew word is, I can go to an interlinear Bible and find out what it means and find out it's got five meanings. And I've got to go and choose which one is the right one. And actually, sometimes it's quite difficult to decide which word, what meaning really is applying in this. So we need the truth, the spirit of truth anyway. So why go to a middleman when you can go direct to Jesus, who is the truth? That's how I would see a lot of that.